I'll actually take you guys back to when everything got got shut down for COVID, um, and we got sent home from Kentucky, and mm-hmm. I got sent back to Florida, and I was out of the water for it was a good five or six weeks, and and so uh, my dad, being a coach at University of Florida, got to be really close with Greg Troy, and he was running his pro group with mm-hmm. Ryan Lochte and Caleb Dressel, and I I reached out to Coach Troy, and I would just asked if there was any way I could, you know, get some practice time with those guys. And, you know, he said yes, and that was, like, an absolute dream for me because Caleb Dressel and Ryan Lochte were, like, my childhood heroes. And I learned one, like, super valuable lesson swimming with them is that if you're not having fun with what you're doing, then you're not going to be the best that you can be. Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Dan. And on this week's show, we are speaking to a guest from over the pond in America. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm really looking forward to another episode of the podcast, as I always do when we have a great guest on. But maybe more so on this one, I'd say. There's some very interesting topics that we're going to be covering here today. And for what I can remember, they aren't topics that we've actually covered before. It's always interesting learning a little bit of more from Swimming Life in America. And I think we're all going to learn a lot today, me and Scott included. Yeah, it really should be a fascinating episode for everyone involved this week. So, our guest trains out of Kentucky in the States and is officially a member of Team England for the upcoming Birmingham Commonwealth Games. So, please welcome Mason Wilby. Mason, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast this week. How are things with you? They're good. They're going well. Uh, We've just been in a really tough training block recently, and so I'm excited to get on here and talk about a few things and get to know you guys a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> right back at you. Um, yeah. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, Mason. When I first saw your name on the Swim England selection sheet for Birmingham, it didn't really ring any bells for me. Um, and for many of our listeners, you aren't really going to be a household name. So let's kick things off with a little bit about your backstory, because you've never actually swam over here in the UK, have mm-hmm. you? I have not, no. So I came. the first time I came over uh, was in 2017 for Summer Champs when they were in Sheffield, like they were uh, a few months ago. And from there, I made the European Junior Team and then uh, the Youth Commonwealth Team. But I haven't necessarily really been back over since then with a few things Mm -hmm. like my priorities to swimming for Kentucky and also COVID for the past two years kind of have thrown things upside down. So I haven't come over as much as I wanted to, but hopefully that'll change soon. So what makes you eligible to swim for England at commies? And why did you choose to represent England rather than America? Yeah, so I guess we'll take it back. Uh, when was it? I think it was in 2016. Um, so my dad's originally from England. And so that gives me the ability to have British citizenship. And so he kind of sat me down when I was 16. And he presented the opportunity to me that he was like, you know, you can either represent America or you can represent Great Britain. And... I've kind of always been a believer that when a special opportunity comes your way, I think you should take it 100% and with full force. And so I just thought being able to represent something that my dad stands for, that my dad's Mm. from, um, being able to meet new people, go to different places, represent a different country would, you know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I felt like I would have kicked myself if I wouldn't have taken it, if you know Mm. what I mean. Yeah. And so... That's kind of the, that's kind of the big story behind it all, and so, so yeah. So you say your dad was a former swimmer. What sort of yes. level did he get to? So he, it's actually kind of funny you bring this up. So he, um, <laughs> gosh. So he actually came and swam at the University of Kentucky. Um, he moved here when he was eighteen okay. from England. Huh. Um, but he was really pushing for me to make the Commonwealth team this year because he was never really able to make the Commonwealth team. He went in seated first at finals for the meet that qualified for Commonwealth and he was never actually able to make it or qualify for it. Um, And so this one was actually really special for him. 
But yeah, so he came over to University of Kentucky uh, when he was 18, and he met my mom there. And so, so yeah. Has it been useful with their previous knowledge of being swimmers to, for, for you to be a top swimmer as well? It, it helps a lot, yeah. I think my mom and dad both kind of have gone through some of, you know, the struggles that I've gone through growing up being a swimmer for God knows how many years. It kind of helps knowing that they've been through it and they can kind of guide me and, you know, give me some helpful tips just kind of, because swimming is a very hard, hard sport. And so it's nice having your parents to mm-hmm. go through mm-hmm. some of the things that you go through. And your dad's a mm-hmm. coach now as well over yes. in, uh, is it the Canadian Olympic program? Yeah. So he's the senior coach for the Canadian Olympic program. So on top of being a former swimmer, he's mm-hmm. a senior coach. Yes. Is there any, um, or was it hard for him to almost sit back and watch you develop? Was he one of those parents who was always trying to be on poolside and push you to be the best you can be? So it was funny because he coached for the University of Florida for uh, around 18 years. And the club team that I swam out of used the University of Florida pool. So they would swim from, you know, two to four. And then I would be in the water from four to six. And so I would always kind of be like, all right, dad, you know, off you go. But he actually did an amazing job (laughs) of separating being a parent and a coach one of the things that him and I actually talked about mm-hmm. recently is that, you know, when we would sit out at the dinner table, he would ask for permission to talk about swimming and he would say, all right, this is, you know, coach will be talking right now, or this is dad talking right now. You know, it, it was really nice for him to be able to separate, you know, being a coach rather than being a dad. And that's one thing that I always absolutely mm-hmm. loved about him and I's relationship. Nice. So there were no negative effects whatsoever, no sort of parent pushing or too <laughs> higher expectations put on your shoulders or anything like that? No, not at all. They've, both my mom and my dad, you know, they've always said that this is your journey. Like, we're going to support you the whole way through. And, you know, you see so many, you know, kids, parents these days, you know, almost being their agent in their athletic mm. career. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost you know, ruining youth sports. And so that's one thing I've loved about them so much is they've let me take care of my own journey, but they've been there in full support the whole way. And you've already kind of got the monkey off your back by the the fact that you've already beaten his swimming career. You, you've got to the Commonwealth Games this summer. Yeah. No, like, the, the, <laughs> it's, it's almost that your, your career is still so young, but the pressure of mm-hmm. getting further than your parents is, is already gone. Yeah. Do you know what was, I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. It was funny, so... Uh, My granddad was able to come watch me swim, um, and it was actually the second time he's ever come watch me swim in my life, which was super special for me. This was at uh, British Champs uh, a few months back, and it was really funny because he didn't know that he, like, put this pressure on me, but I sat down with him before the two-fly finals, and he was like, now you know, your dad went in seated first for his event when he was trying to make the Commonwealth team and he didn't end up making the team. And I was like, Whoa, God, I'm, I'm seated first right now for the 200 <laughs> fly. And you've just told me this, <laughs> I, but I found that hilarious. I told my dad that after and I was like, Oh my gosh, imagine if I didn't qualify. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure, but you're there now. You're there now. We will touch yeah. for commies a little bit later, but I, I first yeah, want us to talk good. about Kentucky. So was it a simple choice to go to Kentucky because your dad was Mm -hmm. there? So I had always kind of like growing up, whenever we were a big Florida Gator fan growing up, obviously, because my dad coached there. That was uh, the college that was in our city. But um, whenever like the basketball teams would play, we'd be like, oh, we're like, we're going against Kentucky, like all this other stuff. And so when the recruiting process kind of came around, they weren't one of my first schools that I was really like focusing in on, which was surprising. They kind of came later in, in the process, um, which actually kind of helped a little bit because I had already canceled out, you know, a few of the schools. And then once, uh, once my mom and dad and I kind of sat down and I was like, you know, I want to take a real look into Kentucky. They actually went up there with me, uh, to Lexington where I am now. Mm. And we were driving through the city and like, we saw, 
his old house, my mom's old house, my dad's old apartment he lived in. And it was almost like they were going back in time and reliving their college days, which was really fun. <laughs> but yeah, once, once I came up and once I, you know, met the team, met the coaches, kind of heard about my dad and my mom's past and, you know, all of their experiences here, the decision was super easy. Well, we're going to have to put our hands up a little bit because we know not too much stuff about Kentucky at all. So you're going to have to fill us in. What What's the program like out there? What, the, what Any different training methods, the weekly schedule, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So um, for a college standpoint, we are a combined program, uh, men and women. Um, and so the there's the head coach, Lars Jorkinson, and then there's a few assistant coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, Macklin Simpson is with the women, and then Jordan Lieberman and Michael Camper are the men's two coaches who I mostly uh, mostly train with. And um, so, I mean, the schedule's pretty normal. We'll do, you know, three lifts per week, and then we'll do, I think it's nine practices um, per week as well. In the summertime, we run uh, doubles, well, really... It's doubles Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, and then we'll add lifts in on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So really, those are triple days, and those are terrible. Mm. They're awful. They're really hard. Um, <laughs> but I mean, they're really. It really doesn't vary much of the training. It's all kind of just normal training. Um, mm. Earlier in the season, so our season runs basically from August to March. We'll do all of our, you know, pre-training mm. stuff in August, September, and then we'll have our conference meet, which is SECs, and that'll be uh, February, and then March is when NCAs is, and so you have the normal, you know, pre-season conditioning stuff earlier in the season, and then once you get, you know, towards taper time, which is a glorious time, um, we'll get more speed stuff, more rest, you know less lifting and all that kind of stuff. So what happens in between March and May Mm -hmm. when the international competition is coming around, but technically your season at Kentucky is done? Yeah. So usually people normally have a choice whether they want to go home to their hometown, their home club team uh, and train over the summer. Or Mm. if you know, you like your college training, if you want to stick to a normal lifting program you know, live in an apartment, live in a house, you're able to live there. And, you know, it's more individualized, I would say, of what meets you want to go to, what your training is going to be like. So, like for me, um, after we had NCAAs, I had a a week time period where I kind of tried to hold my taper and then I just flew right out to um, Mm. British Champs. But it's, I would say it is more individualized just based on whether you want to go to nationals or you want to go to world trials or just whatever you really want to do. And how do you balance, like, because of course you're working towards a degree, how do you balance that working for uni as well as the training as well? Yeah, so it is difficult. It's one thing that I really did have to kind of get used to my freshman and sophomore year. Um, but we have an absolutely amazing support staff here. I mean, not just on the academic side. Uh, we have a guy named Josh Ray here who's our academic advisor, and he kind of, you know, sets your schedule to where your classes are going to be throughout the day compared to, you know, your practice schedule, your lift schedule, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the people here at Kentucky really do make everything so easy for you to where you really just need to be, you know, the best student you can be and the best athlete you can be. And so that really does help out a lot with the whole transition period. I'm I'm getting ready for you to make us jealous here, but what are the facilities like? Because you, you said you've raced over here, you've raced at Sheffield, which is mm-hmm. the best pool in this country, in in my opinion. It. Yeah. What's it like yeah. over in Kentucky and all of the training pools that no doubt you're gonna have that we don't have over here? Yeah, they <laughs> they are very nice. I will say that. I mean I absolutely love Sheffield's pool. It's been one of my favorite pools that I've ever swum in, honestly. Mm. Um but it's I will fast. say yeah, mm. we like for our weight room, I always brag on our weight room. Um, we have the football team's hand me down weight room, and so we've got, I think it's a total of, I think it's a total of eighteen different weight racks, uh, and it's basically just like in a in an L shape, and then there's as many dumbbells as many weights as you need, um, and then from there. Yeah. There's a, there's a little side door in the weight room and that leads into our nutrition room. 
And we have the best nutrition facility in the country, I would have to say, because um, we have a lady named Monica Fowler, who is our nutritionist. And what we have in there is basically six different kitchen, kitchen stations, refrigerators, basically like uh, that line the, the room with any meats, eggs, rice, pasta, anything you need to eat for the day. And so you can just basically <laughs> go in there, eat whatever you want. And it's all free of charge, oh basically. God. Yeah. Oh, stuff of <laughs> dreams. I was oh, going to wow. say, you are really, you are set up to succeed. You now, really are. You? you really are. <laughs> I mean, with all those facilities that you've just said, I mean, why would you ever think of coming over to the UK and training here? You wouldn't, would you? <laughs> I mean, I definitely would post-college because I want to get those luxuries, you know, once I'm done with the whole, you know, four or five years here. But mm. I mean... It is. Mm. We are very spoiled here. So there's no yeah. thought to check out Loughborough or Bath over here at all after your studies are done. No, there definitely is. That's you know one thing. I have another year here. Uh, for the NCAA was mm -hmm. able to grant us another year of eligibility over here. Um, and so I'm mm. taking that year right now. I'm going to do a graduate certificate. But after that, I know. I mean, the door is kind of wide open for me. Um, I haven't, you know, made a decision of what I want to do, but I mm. definitely am looking, you know, the possibilities of coming over, joining a center and just kind of figuring that stuff out. Yeah. I've always just kind of said when the time's right, I'm going to decide what I want to do. I would never really want to, mm. you know, commit myself to something and then not be happy with what I'm doing, if that makes sense. But yeah. I mean, mm. I'm definitely looking forward to that kind of stuff and making those, those decisions. So with all these facilities, training, uh, racing, loads more in America, is there anything mm -hmm. in particular that you think is going to set you up really well for competing at the Commonwealth Games this summer? So one of the things that I think I love about college swimming is that you're able to have, you know, 20 to 30 different guys that you train with every single day and they become to be your best friends and know your goals and you know, train with you and push you to be the best that you can be. And I think that's one thing that always helps swimmers over here is that you have a group of people that want you to succeed and want you to be the best that you can be. Even when, you know, you go through a plateau or you struggle a little bit in swimming, they're always there to pick you up a little bit and, you know, help push you forward. And I think that's one thing that separates, you know, college training compared to everywhere else in the world. I'm so glad you said the word plateau there because that's actually the next bit I want to talk about. I want to talk about this 200 fly PB of yours because in 2017, you went a 159.8 and that time mm -hmm. stood for the best part of four years. Uh, you hit that plateau uh, and you were hitting like two minutes for the next three or four years. But then in 2021, so last year, you dropped four seconds, a massive four seconds went 155.9. How did that happen? How, how did that happen so suddenly? Yeah, that's a great question, honestly. Um, I do think, I will admit that I went through kind of a tough period in my swimming career, um, my freshman and sophomore year. I It's very easy to kind of blame other people when things go wrong. It's really easy to kind of say like, oh, I wasn't doing the right practices or, oh, something happened or, you know, it's easy to say, oh, someone else messed it up for me. But I think it took a little bit of maturing to kind of own up to the fact that I wasn't really putting forth my best effort or I wasn't, you know, fully focused for two years of my life to really being the best swimmer I could be. And so um, I'll actually take you guys back to when everything got, got shut down for COVID um, and we got sent home from Kentucky and I got sent back to Florida and I was out of the water for, it was a good five or six weeks and you know I was going on runs every day and I was doing you know weird push-ups and stuff in my garage and it kind of made me appreciate the sport of swimming a little bit more and so uh my dad being a coach at University of Florida got to be really close with Greg Troy and he was running his pro group with mm -hmm. Ryan Lochte and Caleb Dressel and they were swimming out of a pool in Ocala, which is a good 45 minute drive from Gainesville, where I'm from. And I, I reached out to Coach Troy and I would just asked if there was any way I could, you know, get some practice time with those guys. 
And, you know, he said yes, and that was, like, an absolute dream for me because Caleb Dressel and Ryan Lochte were, like, my childhood heroes. And I learned one, like, super valuable lesson swimming with them is that if you're not having fun with what you're doing, then you're not going to be the best that you can be. And seeing them, you know, kind of deal with the whole struggle of having the Olympics pushed back another year and seeing them struggle with the dry, the problems of having a 45 minute drive to a pool every single day kind of, you know, showed me that they were still being super positive coming to practice like that. And there's no reason for, you know, me to come into practice and think like, Oh, I have to come into practice. It's like, Oh, I get to come train with these guys. I get to do a sport I love. You know what I mean? So I think it took a lot of maturing yeah. for me. And also I learned, you know, two good lessons swimming with them that kind of set me up for a better two years, which I really appreciate it. So essentially it was you getting out of the plateau was all about mental maturity. So pushing through what was a struggle and mm-hmm. essentially looking up to older, more experienced athletes and picking out, this is what they love about the sport. This is what yeah. I need to go back to. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say, I came into practice with, you know, a more positive attitude that I got to share the pool with, you know, 20 other guys that were my best friends. And, Mm. you know, from there, the, you know, pieces just kind of fall into the puzzle and I figured some things out and Mm. no, I just think it was a lot of just mental maturity that I needed to make to be able to swim Mm. a little bit faster. What sort of um, support and encouragement did you get from your, your family? Because obviously they're, they're former swimmers. Your dad's a coach. Mm -hmm. I bet they were the best people in the world to have in your corner. They were, they were, they, like I said, they, you know, they support me, you know, the whole way through, even, you know, those two years that I did struggle a lot, you know, they would always, you know, tell me how proud they are of me, no matter, you know, how my swimming went or anything like that. And they were nice to also have some, you know, difficult conversations with that I needed to have and, you know, hear the brutal truth from them, which helped a lot. But I mean, they were my, you know, they were my rock through it all and, you know, I couldn't thank them more for all of, you know, all they did for me. So did you have at any stage during those hard two years of any negative m- mentality in terms of like giving up or changing events or anything like that? Yeah, so I I honestly would say that if I didn't go, you know, 155 at that meet, I probably wouldn't be doing my fifth year and I wouldn't be swimming right now. Honestly, that was kind of the swim that, you know, showed me my full potential in the sport. Which, I mean, that's a lot for me to say, but it's, it's true. And so I do, I do think, you know, I did love swimming when I was, you know, 18 or 17, 16. And then through those two years, I did fall out of love with the sport a little bit. But, you know, those things did kind of bring back the love for me, which was really good. And what was your initial reaction when you looked up at the scoreboard to see four seconds have been shaved off your PB? I I thought the scoreboard was wrong to be honest with you. <laughs> I So, I knew I had put up a lot of good training that summer. I knew I could go really fast and the original plan really was for me to come over to, um, for Olympic trials for Great Britain because I wanted, you know, to be able to make the Olympic team that's been a lifelong dream of mine. But I would have had to go through a 14-day quarantine and I don't know if anyone's done a 14-day quarantine and then swam a two-fly, but I don't think that would have gone very well for anyone. Um, and so, yeah, I I knew I was going to be able to go fast, but I didn't really think that fast. And so I was really, really happy when I looked at the scoreboard and honestly thought the scoreboard was wrong for a second. I'd be absolutely ecstatic if I saw four-second PB on my tune. <laughs> oh, oh, I was. Oh, trust I've me. I've done it. I've made it. <laughs> trust me. I was so happy. But also, I was just like, oh, my gosh. Like, what? I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and then you got second place at the SEC's... No, third place at the third, SEC's yeah, this third. last year. Mm-hmm. Was that... That was almost a vindication that sticking with it was worth it. It wasn't just that fluke one-off swim. Yeah, I do. I do think so. My, we hadn't necessarily had a guy uh, medal at SECs, and I think it was ten or twelve years, and that was mm. basically my whole motivation. That's uh, that season is that I really wanted a medal in the two hundred butterfly, um, 
And my whole thing kind of mm-hmm. coming to Kentucky is I want to leave this place better than I found it. And, you know, if I meddled and I've motivated someone else to push for that goal, then that's all that really matters to me. Yeah, that's my next question, actually. We've touched upon it already, but if there's a swimmer listening who is experiencing a similar sort of thing, like they're struggling with a plateau, what would your advice be? Yeah, I would honestly have two things, uh, two little pieces of advice. The first thing would be to just never give up on yourself. Uh, Like I said, I probably would not still be swimming if that swim hadn't happened. And, you know, in my circumstance, four years is a very long time not to go a PB. And Mm -hmm. so, I mean, even if, you know, someone's going through a two-year plateau, just keep pushing and keep believing believing in yourself because you never really know when that opportunity is going to come. And then the second thing I would probably have to say is just have fun with what you're doing. You know, like I said, I learned the lesson that you don't necessarily, you don't, shouldn't have the mindset of that you have to come to practice, that you, you know, have to train, you know, you get to, you have the opportunity to do a sport you love, to share the pool with some of your best friends. And so I think those two things can help really push anyone through a plateau that they're going through. Definitely yeah. love that advice. Now, you've been through the plateau. You're now selected for the Commonwealth Games this summer for England. What is the goal this summer? Yeah, so I never really like putting like goals out there. Um, but I do really want to get a medal at Commonwealth Games. I think that would be awesome. It'd be I'm trying Chad to think Poe. who's in the two flies. Yeah. So you've got so, Chad, yeah. It's, Chad, I don't think Jimmy's racing it. I don't think he would either. It's got an opportunity. Yeah, so that would be awesome. Mm, yeah. Good um, chance, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then really I, I never really get a chance to really know the guys over there. I mean, I've roomed with you know Tom Dean at European Juniors, and I know a few of the guys pretty well, but... I just want to make some connections over there, meet some of the guys and get to know them really well because they are, you know, such a great group of guys and it'd mean the world to mm. me if, you know, I'd be able to come become friends with these guys. So, uh, Yeah, we, we, we've spoken to loads of them. We can highly mm-hmm. recommend yeah. having a chat and a talk. <laughs> All and of them. They're, they're great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they seem like awesome people. And Do you have uh, an idea of when you're going to be flying over? Is it going to be a week or two before? Yeah, so we've got a training trip in Lanzarote uh, in, I think it's a month time. Yeah, just under a month time. And then Mm -hmm. from Lanzarote, Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to be flying into Loughborough and then uh, staying in a house there with a guy named uh, Jacob Goodman and a few other of the teammates there. And then I'll be based Mm -hmm. out of Loughborough for, uh, what is that, three weeks. And then we'll have like the holding camp and whatnot Mm -hmm. and then Mm -hmm. travel to Birmingham. Very nice, nice. nice. Excited now. Yes, very excited. I can't wait. I'm so excited for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Mason, thank you so much for coming on to this week's show. I I think if anyone's taking anything away from this, I actually hope a few parents are listening because there's mm-hmm. a really interesting mm-hmm. lesson for how your parents supported you, how I love the idea of coach dad and then dad dad. Yeah, it's, I, I thought that the way he separated that out that that's amazing, and especially their support through your um, through your plateau being, I don't know, mm-hmm. brutal truths. Maybe they're the best people it, for it to come from. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the the story of perseverance as well. I I hope many people have taken away from that. Yeah, that would be awesome if you know I could help some people through anything. You know, that's kind of the stuff that I would hope for. So yeah, a story of not giving up, basically. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Should Love be an inspiration it. to all, Mason, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, shucks. we do usually finish with some quick fire questions. And I know you listen to the podcast, so I know you <laughs> might have some idea that these are coming. Oh, God. I was hoping not, but let's go. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so, what is your favorite event? 50 freestyle. I never get to do it, but 50 freestyle. Nice. Yes, nice. Who is your <laughs> swimming idol? Either Caleb Dressel or Ryan Lochte. What is the proudest moment in your swimming career so far? Uh, getting a bronze medal at the SEC Champs. What is the hardest set you've ever done in training? <laughs> All right. So uh, last summer we did 2100 butterfly off the block on two minutes long course as fast as you can go 
and the goal was to oh, hold nothing. back in 200 speed, which was double O for me at the time. And I probably held that for four or five of them, and then I got up to like 110 by the end. And I will never forget that set <laughs> until I die. And my coach kind of, my coach always jokes about it because sometimes he'll be like, oh, we got 2100s tomorrow. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like seeing nightmares, a ghost. Nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's awful. Oh, wow. Um, what is your pre-race song? I actually don't listen to music before I swim. I've never done well when oh, I listen to music before I swim. Yeah, and so I stopped doing that a while ago. Interesting. Cool. Um, and final question. If you were to go on a road trip, there's three spaces in the car. You can take friends, family, or celebrities. Who would they be? I would take my dog, first of all. I would <laughs> Love <it>. take <laughs> Good probably uh, my best friend, Julian, who trains in uh, Arizona. And honestly, probably my grandma. She absolutely loves nature, and she's one of my best friends. And so I probably choose those three. Very nice. I nice. love it for that. Yeah. Mason, thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Best of luck this summer representing England at the Commies and for your last year at Kentucky. We can't wait to see what you yeah. do. And hopefully we'll catch up with you while you're over here. Yeah, sounds good. Hopefully so. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Yes, thank you very much, Mason. Honestly, I think grab that opportunity of that 200 fly because if you can medal, I mean, that, I think you've got a great opportunity. Just just go for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I will. I will for sure. So that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And me and Dan will be back in seven days time. Yeah, thank you for listening, everyone. And we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.